So uh, this room is about thinking, like may maybe once again, also quick context, but most of you know already in deep funding round three, we had the first time RFP, RFPs being applied in deep funding. And ideally looking really now on a thing like in deep funding round three, the RFPs have been created by mostly Singularity Tech Foundation, but also Fortrack played already a role there, defined for example for the contribution RFPs. And ideally we think about how do you guys see the process of a community-driven RFP taking actually place? It's an open conversation. I have more questions than answers, so I don't know more than you. <laughs> That's for sure. Curtis, please go for it, man. Yeah. There, our perspective in the incubation guild, because we've been operating something very similarly, trying to establish collaboration framework, and then within the context of, say, a research uh, RFP, so we've created the structure for RFPs for research initiatives to kick off, but how do we get collaborators? How do we get contributors? So we've uh, started working on integrating um, Decipher's collaboration framework, which identifies uh, budget, roles and responsibilities, skills that are required, uh, scope, basically everything that you guys did in your presentation today is pretty key on, on what's needed. But just by gauging interest, hey, who's interested in knowledge graphs? Who's interested in in the back end, the LLMs, the agents, the swarms, the whatever needs to be involved in that particular project? You can gauge that interest and communicate with those particular individuals. Um, and then it becomes, it aligns with the, the statement that you guys said, collaboration should be emergent, not forced by just saying, hey, here's what we're working on and notifying the right people, the right interested parties, they can decide whether to commit, you know, commit to it and get involved or, or not. And, and then you establish the framework like you guys clearly defined. What is the scope of the work so they know whether it's of interest to them or not. So just having that pipeline of who's interested and what are you interested in and then communication flow. I think is important. So this outlines really ideally just the first step, right? Because when we think actually about the whole pipeline of RFPs and deep funding, let's map it to a round, for example, right now, we are now in prototyping. It means everything what happened so far was actually getting together the right skill sets, figuring out, okay, what is it exactly? And then we would submit the RFP actually in this regard first to who? Right now, it's up to Jan to actually say, yeah, okay, we do this. How would it look like if the community does this? Like, what is the submission process, the official submission format then of RFPs from whoever wants to come, ideally should be able to generate RFPs, but how are they presented? How are they submitted on which platform? How are they uh, approved by the community? Uh, Raphael, you have your answer. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Felix. Um, yeah, I would say that for a process, we have to, well, begin from the beginning, right? And in my head, at least for myself, the beginning of this should be with the pain, right? If we are, if we are willing to have community-driven uh, proposals on RFPs, they should know what's the pain that the deep funding or singular net uh, have otherwise it's going to be only okay i want to do this and let's do it so it's not it's uh, in my head it's not the, the way it should go so for that we would we should have a list of needs and and uh, requirements from the foundation and the ecosystem of course rejuve and etc um with uh, uh, needed solutions, not necessarily, they do, we don't have, we as the, the, well, the, the foundation, we should have be like, hey, let's develop a knowledge graph for this. Let's develop a LLM for this or whatever. We should say, hey, I have this pain. I have this problem. And please community, bring me some ideas of uh, on how to solve that. And then we would have the RFP is being proposed by the community and say, hey, you should use a knowledge graph to solve your problem. And here is the framework, the general framework. And then we would do this RFP 
And then we would have the community again say, hey, I can develop this, right? And then we would enter a voting process for us to, um, uh, well, to, 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 to fund and, and have it solved. Well, in very high level way, I would say uh, that that would be um, the pipeline, I guess, or, or the flow. Rafi, can I can I pick your brain on something? Uh, so I've thought about this uh, particular idea you had, and my question is in two ways. One, uh, does it mean that the community itself cannot sense the problems as well to bring out? Um, do we think? Um, do, do you? What's your perspective okay. on that? One, two, um, when. When the when when the problem is being sensed, and then by the SNET community or anybody inside, and then it's being brought out, and then community yeah. now uh, proposes a solution. Uh, what is the mechanism of collaboration there, right? How do we collaborate to create a particular RFP in itself when one person can easily do that if the problem has already been restated so those are two things i had in mind when this particular idea came to me as well yeah completely right you uh the two things that you mentioned i didn't mention about collaboration uh, mainly because uh, we uh, because it's in the other room right but we do need to have collaboration that's the whole idea of doing this effort and initiative here i would say again you felix all right no i would love to have um, and I'm not 100% sure that the consensus tool would solve this because we could have a lot of people um, um, ideating, voting and thumbs up, thumbs down in, in, in parts of a blueprint, right? So we would have this final uh, document with a lot of collaboration of the com from the community giving ideas, saying, oh, no, this is not good, or this is good, and so on. Uh, but in first, before this, we should have a very good process of awareness, right? Because we might have the best tool in the world to do this collaboration, but we wouldn't have people enough to collaborate. So this process also of awareness, hey, we are developing this, so this is the place where we should go to, to collaborate and to, hey, check it out, look what you can uh, collaborate and, and support and so on. That's a part, that's a part as well uh, uh, that I see very importantly to collaborate, to the collaboration. So perhaps in the, in the other room, but uh, it's good to talk here as well. Uh, that would be the second my second pos my second view or vision or position about uh, my position about the second question. The first question, um, yes, you're right. Uh, community also has perceptions, right, around what we are going through. So we are facing this now in Deep Funding Round Three. So there are many situations where the, the awarded teams are passing through some challenges. Uh, mainly because we are uh, facing some constraints in the operations and they can propose. You are right. You're right. They also can propose. Ideally, uh, should be another collaborative process, right? I don't know. One of our team says to the deep funding team and say, hey, shouldn't we do a RFP in this direction? So. Let's create one or, or propose or, or do something like that. Also, collaboration, a collaboration between deep funding and the community in this sense would be something very solid because, yes, community has, community also, let, let's put, suffers with some, some situations, right? Um, and they can envision and, and bring uh, this. Yeah. For example, Raphael, one question I have because first you mentioned the thing where you said ideally you would take a little bit the same approach as for proposals proposals as well generally right so people come they create a thing then they submit it then the community votes and then then it gets implemented when we think about the rfps actually then because ideally the rfps would be live on the deep funding around itself already 
So the process wouldn't be, it would then actually in, intermediate process between the funding rounds in this regards. Or do you think that in a deep funding round, there are also open pools then actually where RFPs can be submitted and then be implemented in the next funding round? Like, how would you see this one, for example? Yeah, uh, first, I also would like to state that what we have now with the pools, we have a tooling pool, for instance. And the, the idea at the beginning was exactly, hey, community, do you have an, uh, something that you think can help us? And mainly coming from their pers perception, right, of what, what was happening. So they would propose, but the framework wasn't that clear uh, on how to do that. So having the, an, a process that we are building now and talking about, about uh, an RFP, would even i would say would even kill the tooling pool at uh, when it's uh, ready to go um on the situation of intermediary process i would say that i wouldn't say about intermediary but perhaps felix having it separated from the common the regular round there are some there are some specificities of the RFP pool that we don't see in the other pools, right? And and please, this is just from the top of my mind, okay? We are ideating here. Uh, for instance, the fact that we have sub pools for RFPs. We have a big, uh, we have a large pool, which is called RFP, and then we have this sub pool. So this only, this solely is something different already from the regular rounds. Um, and having this as a, uh, in the other direction. So I ask you, I, I, ask, I mean, the, the ecosystem, we ask the community, what can we have that we solve this? So I'm not sure if the intermediary thing that you mentioned, it would, it would be between two regular rounds, uh, because I see this as a possibility as well. Um, that could be something positive to have. Eric, you have your hands up. Well, I, actually, I just texted that. My, you're talking about implementation. Where is this implemented on? On what? On, on, on the blockchain or where is it implemented? Ideally, already in singularity and archi uh, architecture, where a lot is actually being built as we speak on this regard as well. For example, if we look on Hyperon framework that we make sure, okay, it's built already within Singularity Net, already existing technology uh, tech environments. Mm -hmm. And also to see where does it not fit and what other technical uh, technical environments have to be built up actually in this. And this will so so the question, go ahead, no, sorry, Felix, go ahead. No, no, go for it. But no, the, the thing is that we we actually or, or people in my team uh, have been working on an AI now where, you know, getting information on the Cardano platform can be very confusing at times. There are sites that are not up to date. There are some inaccuracies. Uh, there are some new stuff that is popping up. And the AI that we built is actually scraping all of that information. And you can just go into that AI and ask a question and it actually goes through all of it and gives you the answer that you need to have. So nothing really, you know, you know, uh, breaking news there, but uh, we actually proposed that in Fund 11 on Cardano. Is that something that should have been proposed in here? It's actually, I sent you a link in the live chat here. It's actually, uh, we built a LLM already on this purpose. It was funded in the last deep funding round. And this, this uh, it's fully open sourced, by the way. It's a LLM program, program, which is fed already with a bunch of knowledge on Cardano things and stuff. You can look on the GitHub already and see if you can see some easy stuff or helpful stuff from there, what you can use already. When we speak about our regard, for example, then LLMs, for example, is that from the knowledge graph, we definitely want to have interactions with a LLM. And this is difficult, actually, to map knowledge graphs to a LLM is a use case we definitely want to have. How exactly, if it goes, for example, with knowledge graph embeddings, so you'd actually convert a knowledge graph into vector space architecture, 
So a knowledge graph embedding. And with this node create a similarity because we have a vector space as similar architecture. And vector spaces is the same architecture most LLMs use actually in this regard, right? So say already, oh, okay, how can you build very easy architecture framework already to make sure there can be an easy exchange and access of information between knowledge graphs and LLMs on this figure. Because ideally the LLM becomes your communicator to the knowledge graph. So ideally you have some sort of LLM interface where you communicate to the whole backend actually in, the, in this regard. And not backend, frontend of the, of the knowledge graph. So, and this brings shit lot of rabbit holes with it, dude. Like massive. <laughs> yep. Because LLMs usually tend to hallucinate and when they generate and when they not only start now to extract data, but when you also think about LLMs as data input, so that LLMs also generate data, which is then fed into the knowledge graph. Now you have a massive problem because you have to make sure that LLM generated information data, which is fed into the knowledge graph, is not a hallucinated one. And if you don't want to have human reinforced learning, means bunch of people sitting there checking actually that the information the LLM provides and feeds into the knowledge graph is accurate. Oh, fuck it. Dude, <laughs> yes, that's tricky. Uh, uh, Raphael, you were asking a question there. I'm not completely following what your question is. No, where, where, where your artificial intelligence is, um, having the source of information to answer my question, for instance, when I ask, is it well, Discord? So, uh, no, uh, the, th the thing is that uh, we are a group of guys that are working on some other problems. Um, uh, we're actually working on a delivery system that is actually using AI for references and stuff like that. And then because we were also going to implement that, you know, on maybe on the Kadona blockchain, so then we started looking at the AI project. So one of the guys in the group started doing, and he said, oh, I already done for myself because Cardano is, is, could be confusing. So he actually created an AI that scraped everything so that he can just go in on AI, on that AI and ask questions that we might have. And then the next thing we know was that we, there was some, um, you know, involvement with Emergo, and they also really liked what we were doing. Um, the guys that I work with, if you guys have heard of Coffee Dell, now, well, uh, the group is called NFT Dell from the beginning, and we actually did. Uh, I'll show, send you a link uh, in the chat. And you can look at it yourself. It's a pretty cool little idea. But if you look at all the images and everything, all these images are AI generated. And the guy that is doing all of these things is the guy that actually then ended up doing the stuff uh, that the, the, the Cardano script. Because we we were there were so many questions that we couldn't get answers to, or we were confused about the answers. And so this was kind of like a little side project. And then when Emergo came in, they said, hey, you know what, this is really cool. You guys should seek some funding in, uh, you know, so we seeked funding in, uh, in uh, 11 now for just that portion of it. So, the, so then my next thing was like, okay, well, I usually join you guys and listen to what you say here. Maybe this is something that should be a collaboration with you guys also. And, and, and it's interesting because the way you did this goes exactly in this in the direction that you said, right? It, it, you had the pain in Cardano, and then you went there and created something that could be an RFP to to make it. So yeah, that's that's the way to go. Uh, yeah, Felix. Yeah, I just wanted to come back a little bit to to the topic, to the mm -hmm. RFP processes for for deep funding. But uh, Ubiu, I think you unmuted yourself as well. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that I don't think we are quite off topic. What Eric is bringing is actually contextually relevant to what we're saying because, um, we, yeah, that might be applicable to Cardano, but again, a lot of um, a lot of ways and a lot of things we could draw out from what he's saying, and so this this still brings up. So I I think we still left at that initial level of the whole concept around the ideation 
on on RFPs? How do people idea it? How do groups idea it? How do individuals in that ecosystem idea it? And I think what Eric presents to Roth is a practical case of how he's ideating and how he's taking steps to formulate that. So uh, now if, if we were to ask Eric um, now based on what you guys have done, if we were to create a structure around this, right? A structure where any individual in the ecosystem is able to sense a problem and, and then have it uh, structurally recognized as a process and have it um, structurally uh, put out to the community that this is what I want to solve. I want to gather people to solve this. How do, would we go about this if we were to put a structure around what you did just for sake of um, trying to do it? If we were to put a structure around this, what would that be? So that's what this conversation is. If you can give us maybe anything, any hint as well, I think that would be very, very relevant to this. Or you're asking me? You yeah, yeah. Do you, do you have any hints for us? Like, if we were to structure what you've done in the ecosystem, in the Cardano ecosystem, and we to put a structure into it, into a deep funding, because we are discussing about ideating. So you, what we were rather hearing was more of how you were practically ideating around a problem and how you were going about. So if we were to put a structure around this, what would you, you think that structure should be like? Well, <laughs> oh, I, I'm not so sure if I want to go down this rabbit hole. Because one of the things that we have tried to avoid, uh, Felix know me from, what, two, three years now with my, my involvement in, in the, you know, the, the, the Cardano space. And one thing that I noticed there that, unfortunately, there's a lot of talk. And there's a lot of going around the circles and there is uh, jealousy and their personal uh, vendettas going on. I mean, it, it was to me, it was a circus. So uh, when we created the company that, that I we have now, uh, we decided that we are going to do all of the things that we want to do. We have we have funding from other places. We have a good team in place. And then we do it, and then we we will we will then present it to. In this case, it ended up being uh, Emergo that was interested in what we were doing, and then we took that way to to get into the Cardano space again. Um, so the company that we have is called Trekken, is, is uh, uh, and what we are doing is actually. Um, it's a, we call it secure pack. And basically what it is, is that uh, just to give you the short and the long of the whole, the, how it started, is that uh, millions of dollars are spent on packages being returned to the sender because of any reason you can think of, damaged packages, stolen stuff, or, or whatever it is. We are implementing a system using uh, uh, LiDAR cameras that actually are in the you know taking 3D pictures of the package as it rolls into the truck. Uh, we have then an AI system that are scanning or looking at each package to determine the level of the package, uh, you know, if it's uh, damaged or in any way tampered with. And if it is tampered or not tampered, uh, then if it's not tampered, obviously it continues going to the next spot in the system. But if it is tampered, the AI will then uh, look at it and say, okay, you, you're not within the threshold of what we consider being a good package. And then uh, the package will be already at a very early stage being returned to sender or taken out of the loop of sending it to whomever it needs to be to. Uh, all of this information that is, is gathered is then created in what we call the VIN, it's verified an identification number. And it's basically what it is, it's kind of like an NFT. And that NFT is then put on the blockchain so that the client can actually go in on blockchain and see what happened, where, and what time. Because on blockchain, you can put both timestamp and geolocations and stuff like that. So we're actually using three po points we're using cameras, we're using AI, and we're using blockchain. And then 
So to do the training and all that kind of stuff, we obviously used AI to gather and scrape what we could and then putting it on the blockchain. And that's basically how the idea about gathering the information from Cardano into the AI so that we have somewhere to start. I know this is, you know, bottling all this information in very, very, <laughs> very, very, uh, you know, um, short, short uh, conversation, but that's basically how we got into it. So to answer your question, UBO, is that we did all of this on our own and then came back into Cardano from the, from the backside, so to speak. There's, there's too much going on. Uh, you know, if, if you try to go the regular way and there's community talk and there are people that are, you know, there's certain levels of, of engagement in, in both the Catalyst and all these other places. And it, it just takes too long to do that. So that, that is my short and long. Sorry, I took up so much time. Uh, no problem. Thank you so much. All right, Cody's. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, this is to your question about how, to me, I still see a, a place for the community to propose solutions, building it out how they deem fit. And that's what Deep Fund is for. That's what the current proposals are, is you have a solution, okay, bring it to the table and you have that process. RFC should be collaborators who want to work on SNET proposed problems like it's it's through the organization itself deeming this is what our needs are this is what we need to have work done on and we want to integrate the community but it's it's controlled or decided through the organization itself whether that's decentralized or whether that's SNET it is to me progressive maybe it needs to be SNET in the beginning and then slowly turn into the ambassadors or the community itself uh, whatever that case is they're determining that the clarity, the scope of work, the desires and the needs, and then the community comes and works on it. But instead of individual solutions, because those are proposed through the other pipeline, through the traditional proposals, it's through the RFC initiative. You collaborate, you build, and then you're working on focused projects so that it's not like we see with knowledge graphs. I'm seeing it. We're doing it in AI Sandbox. We're doing it in Incubation. This initiative with Felix and Nori and all them are doing it. And then Hyperon's doing it. And it's just like, we're not quite collaborating yet, which we're on the, the right pathway to, right? So it seems like that's the perfect avenue. You have community problem sensing. You have organization problem sensing. Each have their own pipeline and channel and funding going to it with processes. And it seems like they're all going through the right level of governance, progressive decentralization. It really seems to be in the right direction, in my opinion. So do we need to say uh, the RFC and, and the problem sensing for SNET should be decentralized? Well, I, I think if as long as we have the channels for both, what co the community deems as a solution versus what, you know, SNET as an organization deems as the right direction, the roadmap. That's just my thought. This was so, really good. Actually, I will quickly can mention one to this as well. Is I think really important as well to actually understand what is the difference between a pool and the RFC. Let's say, for example, let's take marketing pool. Marketing pool, everybody can come submit a proposal. I create a podcast. I create video, uh, video content. I create live sessions. I create T-shirts, for example. A marketing RFC would be we want to have a newsletter and the, the problem is already given the proposal is already given the community now actually comes and says this is how i would do the newsletter right in this figure which brings us actually to a really interesting point as well like when we look on rfps one thing is the life cycle of an rfp does not match to the life cycle of a tool of a pool when you look for example now let's craft rfp we would start with a first mvp once the MFP is live, who maintains the stuff now? And how develop it, do we develop it further? Like the ideal thing maybe on the beginning would not even be a fully developed knowledge graph because this takes far too much time to make in one single funding round, right? And we have the problem with, for example, pools. Let's say you have a project where you know you need one and a half years to fully develop it. Now you have to think about five, four, five, six deep funding rounds. 
and each time you have to come back with a proposal to continue something what was maybe already funded on the beginning right but it's difficult actually to bring, build a long-term process across multiple funding rounds because you don't have the security and when we look on knowledge graph rfp for example with this use case we would want to make sure that we are not only starting it but that we are able to first maintain it what was built initially already and that we further develop it maybe not forcefully tied to deep funding pool cycles or rounds in this regard right so um what would that look like does it mean that um, once an rfp is funded um, then that rfp would be eligible to get funding um till it gets completed like uh what yeah i'm just trying to put how that would look like right does it mean like once an rfp has been funded it only will maybe we only fund it for a phase and then uh completion is guaranteed or it has to keep coming back but this time around the coming back is not to the community but this time around is coming back to probably i'm just trying to think through ideas around this time around maybe coming to the review committee committee to look at it and be like oh you've done this all right you can keep going so what would an ideal situation be because i totally do agree like it, if people can't keep coming back every time and all of that it would definitely affect what the future scope of such rfp so how do you see it Yubiu, uh, sorry, I was writing here, but uh, your question was related to when to vote and decide or the length of the development and funding? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the length of the uh, funding for RFPs, right? Because we know, for example, RFPs, let's say, for example, uh, an RFP um, was funded for 100,000. And let's assume that that particular RFP has the team has worked and then they've delivered but definitely like felix said rfp is like most of these stuffs you only do it in phases and then there's still a lot more that needs to be done whether it's coming from the community rfp or whether it was the singularity net rfp uh does again because again these are some of the questions we need to answer around rfp does that team have to come back to an, another rfp like for another voting or don't we shouldn't we have uh, a way that once these people have been funded, the process becomes a, a lot more simpler for them to get refunded to push up their project. Because the first consent would mean that uh, uh, the first thing should be that communities agree that this problem needs to be solved. I think that's what RFP votes should be about and not necessarily about the funds as well. And if you ask me, maybe with time, we may even have to probably do away with the funds for uh in the rfp questions and all that. i don't know but i'm just thinking why it would be necessary to come back again and again when your project was already consented the rfp was already consented by the community that it should be solved well i guess we can we can use the rfp one example right i guess it was more on the sense of okay the first tooling was proposed uh, and then by using the, the the tool itself we discovered that we could grow and, and make it improve it with more with a, a bigger scope right so we went with the rfp one in round three this might happen again we potentially we are not going to be able to describe the full scope of something at the beginning so the team would be able to get back uh, and propose again in a second round, second round of, of funding. Uh, but only if things uh, change, if if the scope is the same, I, I'm not sure if this is the, your point. Uh, the team should receive the fund from the from the beginning to the end, right? If it's proposed and voted and approved. Felix, what's your thought on that? So many thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot as well over here in my head. So I just wanted someone else to compare that. Hmm. 
No, the, actually, on this one, I I don't have strong, let, let's say, ideas on this yet. So I I'm, I don't even really want to add something to this else than a rougher set already. And also, my, my head is still really sticking to what, what Curtis mentioned before as well, like, understand the pains. I think that this was it. And also in this regard, like, when... Like, not everything always have to come from community, right? For example, when we look on Singularity and Ecosystem, we have to acknowledge one very simple fact. Singularity and Foundation knows the best about the ecosystem. They know the best about the problems where no no one else actually understands, oh, okay, this is really an issue, right? Most of us, we are not in SNET uh, full-time, while, while they are actually in this regard. And actually having Singularity and Foundation in a place where they actually can state this maybe we can call it sps singularity and problem statements or something like this like what on cardano what we have actually with the cps and cips right cardano problem statements and cardano improvement proposals the next year on this figure maybe taking a little bit from this methodology and say maybe there can be it can even be totally decoupled from deep funding rounds actually and to say this can be a totally parallel, always open process where problems are as long stated as long a, a successful RFP have been addressed to them, actually. That's a good point, Felix, and I have a question on that. Um, Singularity Net Foundation has claimed their problem statements, right? And that's essentially what is hyper on and open cog addressing what is uh review addressing what is twin protocol addressing like they already have chosen their problem statements is deep fund its own community and entity or is it meant to represent snet foundation if it is i feel like we're already getting a bit of direction now we just need to fill in the gaps for the community or is deep fund an experiment that's taking on its own journey and its own path separate from the foundation? I don't actually know, to be honest. That's a really interesting question. I think one really interesting what come, I think what come out actually from uh, the last expert call from uh, the deep funding token thing was the topic of maybe move deep funding into the direction really of a DAO and the decoupled entity from SNET Foundation. So also going into this direction of spin-off actually in this regard. But when we look on DLT-based innovation funds, what we can usually observe is that this is the place where all entities come together. Right? When you look on Catalyst, for example, Catalyst is a place where IOG, as Emogo, as companies, as communities, as whole projects which have their own ecosystems, actually have the space to all come together. Right? I think that's the power, actually, of, this, uh, of these innovation funds because they provide a totally open framework, actually means open to everyone, ideally. The community, as well as entities, as well as spin-offs, actually, in this regard. So maybe, I'm not sure where I think, well, it's stated already, right, that uh, we are on the transition of a DAO, or want to go into the, into the direction of it, or maybe not forcefully DAO as we understand it from, from the DAO or what's not in this regard, but definitely DAO, DAO structure. And it makes sense to see it all emerging into our own environment, but maybe an own environment for everyone. So having this one place in the ecosystem where everybody can join together, actually, and work collectively on important problems to further build and, and enhance the ecosystem. The foundation's actions do align with exactly what you're saying because the what they're communicating to the public is all these initiatives will become DAOs. So now it makes sense what you're saying is this community is meant to be that pilot, start build the structure and foundation so that all the spinoffs can have their own smaller community. And this is where they come together, the town hall of those communities. So that makes sense with the actions I see the foundation taking okay thank you for that all right so some questions back to the issue of rfps uh, i think we've spent a lot of time talking about the idea team how do how does that idea come from uh, what about the structure of the rfps um 
should it be do we think um it, sh it ought to be a continuous open um structure um should it be um in, um, in in collaboration with deep um with rounds um do we need um the, uh, the rfc itself uh can can it be done under a framework of a time and then um should we have a different process for rfcs and rfp so i want i want us to just have discussions around that structure about how will this be in, in ideal in ideal case and what is the best way we think this RFCs, RFPs can better be in the future. I have my ideas, but I'll, I'll wait. Go, Curtis. Go. Yeah, go for it. Curtis. Please, please. We need, we need new point of view. <laughs> what I'd love to see, and this is what I've been kind of hoping for with Catalyst for a while, is you have the RFP where the community, again, is guided by which in Catalyst using their terms, challenge settings, they're, they're problem sensing. To some degree, the organization is trying to figure out what that is. Right now, that's the categories inside the RFPs. The organization's giving you a box or a framework. Here's where you wanna operate, we need solutions, here's the intent, and really getting a bit clearer on what is the desired outcomes or the intent of those different categories. But s some people submit their RFPs that are more like, hey, we want to research and we want to develop and we want to collaborate on it. And here's our version of what that looks like. Here's our interpretation. They get awarded, but that awarded is to start an RFC, to start creating that collaboration, start the research, start a little bit of whatever's necessary. As we know, when you expand, you, you, when you have a smaller team, you work better. When you get too large, it just starts to dissipate. So having that vision, starting it, saying, all right, I get the problem. Here's my perspective. Let's start defining it. Now we have room for collaborators to say, I can buy into that. I know what the picture is. I can see it. I want to buy into that. I'll start, you know, I'll work in the RFC. Then the RFC has its own RF, internal RFPs on clarifying the scope of work, the roadmap, the whatever is necessary to fulfill the original RFP. I don't, that's my kind of my thoughts is public starts out public as an RFP. It's saying selected by the community that initiates RFC. Okay. We're going to get to work now. What do we need? Who do we need? Let's map it out. But it's a bit, I don't want to say centralized. It's just a smaller team that's starting out and they're expanding as, as it grows. My thoughts. Also centralized, decentralized. I think we, we don't have to make the mistake to say everything has always to be decentralized, right? Sometimes it's really not wise. I mean, decentralization is a concept to get specific things done for in a specific methodology. It applies to some cases, like blockchain itself. It's a tool actually in this regard, right? It's great for something. It's not great for everything. I don't need blockchain on my fucking fridge. No need for it. Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> it won't change the taste of my apple if it runs on Cardano or Ethereum or whatnot. So I think also in this regard to also in this regard because this was a question we Jan mentioned actually. Like yeah. does it all like is it bad if as that foundation, for example, would be a facilitator or steerer of this process as well, right? Let's say, for example, this weekend. We also think about what could be actually cool is to have, we have deep funding already. Deep funding is one specific, also in this regard, process tool set, which is very good for some things. It's not good for everything. If you want to build a three years project and you have really deep thoughts and everything and whatnot, it's not so nice to build your project over three years over funding rounds where you can't make sure Maybe some whale don't like me one day anymore and he will download my shit and now I have to run six months without funds, but my team is working already since a year and now I can't pay them anymore and then it's shit, right? And ideally in the ecosystem as well to say there can be multiple solutions in this regard, which don't replace each other, but which create a diverse set of multiple processes. Here we have deep funding rounds. Here we could have RFP processes and making sure that they even enrich each other in this regard. 
but maybe that's different governance systems as well. Like one solution fits all doesn't work. Like voting is great for some things, but for example, me personally, I highly doubt voting. I think voting is a very stupid thing, actually, if you consider it on plutocratic mechanisms where you say, okay, the richest people make the decision. And you speak about grassroots or decentralization or what not in this regard. It just doesn't match, right? And also to say, if there are multiple processes, they also can have multiple governance systems, actually, and playing them out as experiments and see what can we learn when we do this? What can we learn when we do this? Because one of the most relevant things, something I think like deep funding is doing, it generates massive experience and capacity for Singularity and Foundation themselves, as well as for the community. They learn a lot all together through this stuff, right? So having multiple solutions in parallel, actually, could be something really interesting where you could say we can totally de-tie or decouple it, actually, from deep funding rounds in this regard, deep funding cycles, but still make sure that it coordinates and aligns perfectly with deep funding. And now deep funding becomes even an incubator for other singularity network mechanisms, actually, in this figure. Wow. Felix, um, what I would say is um, this last statement, we need to highlight it in bold. And maybe this is like the outcome of this conversation. Um, if we want a summary of everything we've said here, um, let's go back to that last statement you actually made. I think this captures the heart and soul of everything we've actually discussed here. Um, I Yesterday I was um, listening to a podcast and someone said something that I, I, I found very valuable. It's in line with what you said. The person said nature is very, very um, wise and nature doesn't give a fuck about any principle. Anytime he wants to, uh, he realizes that a particular principle or algorithm works he uses it and when it feels this particular algorithm is not going to be uh it's not going to work for us he changes it he uses another algorithm so in reality nature is not democratic it's not autocratic it has no you can't see any particular system that you can say this defines nature because nature is unlike human that sticks to um certain idea uh, ideologues right nature is not nature just chooses what is um, working at a particular time. And then when that governmental system can bring out the desired outcome, nature does that. So you see nature at certain point in time being democratic. You can see nature at certain time being autocratic. And other times it, it, it just builds up different algorithms. But nature cares about one thing. I have a problem and I want to solve it. So I'm, I'm, re I'm relating it with your last statement when you talked about the fact that, oh, RFPs and RFCs, and deep funding rounds could be solving different problems in the ecosystem. And we should not um, try to box it up into a particular mold that we've already created. Oh, we have a deep funding round and this is how it operates in here. People always vote. And as such, we are now coming into, the, we are trying to build a structure for RFPs. And we are saying, oh, there must be necessarily a vote system. Meanwhile, in this case, it's supposed to be centralized decentralization that's supposed to work and so what we as humans would do is we want to stick to decentralization because we feel oh we are blockchain based organizations and decentralization is our core functionality but if that was nature nature would be wise to understand that in this case we need some level of centralization with smaller elements of decentralization and it to do just that so that is what i'm seeing from what you're saying when you said um like we need to understand that RFPs and RFCs may come in very different formats and it may need or sometimes it will need some level of centralization from SNET being the one pivoting certain things. And there will be some levels, maybe the one of community can be more community based with uh, with uh, SNET having lesser strength as compared to the SNET uh, RFPs where SNET have much more control as compared to the community. But a mix of all of these can just be it and not necessarily tying ourselves to any ideology and that, that can really hold us down. So that's what I'm seeing here. Yeah.
because what I really like also weird to think about like what we said already singularity at foundation teams themselves they have over average understanding of the ecosystem right and when we say for example full decentralized voting let's say our decision making processes it's not able to capture the strength actually if I would know Raphael votes on something with 20 HIX and the person would just join steep funding and singularity and ecosystem with 1 million HIX personally I don't I would much more prefer to have Raphael make the decision because he's his fucking own employee he knows about the pain he knows about, about the stuff right why right? then it's like no it should be fully decentralized and now actually we take off the advantage what singularity net actually by default is able to offer to decision making processes to the community in this regard as well and not everything has to be decentralized it can be fully open whoever wants can generate rfps however they want when whenever they want and will be implemented so this is fully open for example i like on for example maybe some of you know about uh, polka.opengov for example with a polka, polka simply with the, with the circle there and stuff. It's quite interesting actually as well. You have a middle body which says actually, don't make the decisions per se, but they say which are the most relevant proposals and should be actually up to vote. So it's a middle thing actually between decentralization versus centralization, trying to capture the, the, the strengths of both actually in this regard. But Curtis, yeah, you have your answer. Uh -huh. Highly uh, agree and align with your perspective, Felix, and share share very similar goals. Um, I think this also overlaps very heavily with like the roundtable discussion that we had at the ambassadors, and it's having those points of accountability and responsibility. I think that applies to what, exactly what you're saying, and in some cases, it should be singularity net making that decision because they know best they know the environment and the atmosphere and and the roadmap and the direction where the some of the community members may not know all that so it makes sense where they make the decisions and this kind of the way i saw roundtable could be is similar but they're making decisions informed decisions informed by the community and in some cases that's votes you know votes come through and then they read the votes and they say okay this is how i see it translates and i'm making an informed decision based on that but it's still them making the decision or alternatively they're uh pushing the survey they're controlling how the information should be ingested but then the community ultimately makes the decision but somebody's still controlling the flow of information and how it's being digested by the community so that there's perspective. So I totally agree that there's ways to do this where it's a degree of centralization, decentralization, and we can approach uh, all the different problem areas and through categories, RFPs, regular proposals through Deep Fund and, and the RFCs. I, I love the direction that we're heading. Thanks. As when we go, for example, in more detail, like for example, uh, Asset Foundation have more than 140 employees. Like it, it wouldn't be necessary that everybody in Asset Foundation then actually approves, right? But for example, from community side, it's a tremendously difficult process to figure out who are the experts on the domain, who know really well about this domain, about this topic. And if you're not since years in the community and know a bunch of people and projects and what they are doing, it's insanely difficult for the community to select a group of experts around specific areas. For Singularity and Foundation, it would be much easier actually in this regard, right? They know already, oh, okay, here we have our developer teams on this product, on this product, on this product. And I can simply say, hey, we need two of you, three of you, four of you, two of you. Can you come together, check this stuff here? This really maps your areas, your domains, your expertise already on this regard. And I can rely on them actually in this regard. On a, on another way, then we may have to rely on whales, because what whales may, or what let's say many large asset holders actually vote for, is something what benefits their own financial interest. Where they think, oh cool, this new wallet, this new dex, this new thing, oh cool, this will make it 
even better for me to, to handle my as massive assets, right? They don't forcefully act in the largest interest of the ecosystem. While in Asset Foundation, we can assume that the people there have already a natural stake in, act, uh, actually in, in the thing. I don't, I don't want to get too high level, but I think part of the problem is that we're kind of trying to qualify uh, technical people and teams who are creating experientially trying to qualify them with words on a piece of paper and um yeah. we're trying to we're trying to see past that how can we see past that how can we know they can do what what's on the paper essentially um uh yeah and so I, I, I come back to this experiential, how can they be qualified experientially through through seeing how they how they create? I wonder. Put them in a one hour call with fly and we will we will not. <laughs> no. oh, I didn't want to say, but actually yeah. <laughs> I think I, I do so. Uh, in the other room, we we were talking a little bit about like uh, um, idea for, for instance, uh, speed dating hackathons, things like this. Like, I imagine that stuff like that can be interesting. Yeah, not not to make yeah. it kind of like test. Go ahead, Ubio. Yeah, like I'm just I I was just I I was bewildered by that um, suggestion, speed dating hackathon. So. Most hackathons are to build projects, but this time around, we just want to speed date and see the capacity that lies between us. I think currently, uh, Cordis and I and a group of other guys, we're doing something similar. We are trying to speed dates to understand some of our strengths and, and as a team and uh, what we have and what we can build together. So I, I'm, I feel like there's a whole lot to unpack in this whole, um, in this whole um, systems um as we go uh just to uh reinforce that okay um you you talked about fly about the situation of people how do we get to, to know people beyond what they write on the papers so but there is something uh do, do you think that if now let's assume we want to do centralized decentralization whereby uh People in the SNEP community, um, and in this context, the deep funding um, community, the, the, the facilitators there, um, do you think that they have the capacity to actually speed date, to actually know, okay, um, taking a team of Ubio and Felix and Cordis, for example, to work on this particular RFP? Would be uh, would be much more beneficial or should give us uh, much more efficiency based on their past record. Do you think that can work? Well, like if I can come with a, a far out analogy, uh, that is Professor of Cybernetics who was telling me uh, a, a really a really nice activity which you can do. So you get a hundred people in a room, and you get uh, you pair them off into fifty pairs. Everyone, each pair has a task, um, but they have to communicate in non-language, gobbledygook or just uh, non-words, sounds. Um, they can't use actual words or or um, uh, like pointing. They they have to just speak nothingness. And each you, you change partners and iteratively iteratively change more and more partners. And through this process. Uh, there emerges a kind of language between all the pairs as they pair off with each other. They start making their own language between them until they're paired off enough that it kind of synchronizes between the group. So like on that level, it's possible to get 100 people to create their own language in a fairly small amount of time uh, if done in the right way. But I think it does need kind of yeah, some method. But but that process you just aligned is much more um, doesn't is not time efficient, is it? It uh it's it's like it's an activity for a group over or you can make it shorter or longer, but like say a couple of hours, an hour maybe, hour, two hours. It's like, yeah, but 
Uh, look, look at practically what I'm saying here, right? We are yeah, talking. Please, about, please. Look, look, look at it here. Huh? We are saying that maybe in some context of RFPs and and RFCs, it's even best for maybe the uh, SNETs to just make the choice instead of this whole experiment of just like all this whole process you just aligned where you pay people and we're trying to create a language. Like, why create a language when someone can just simply point out? And be like, hey, 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 you, I think you guys can work on this project based on your capacity and what we've seen so far. So, like, that is what we're saying. If we can decentralize certain aspects of this whole RFP part of it and then centralize some core essence because we feel that the the, the SNET community or the people that are doing this full-time should have better knowledge. Is that not better than us? Um, even if it is just ours, but again... Is it not better or you still feel like going through these other routes to get people to speak the same language is better? No, yeah, I think I think it's really I think it's really valid. I think the assumption is that all of those are qualified um, by that point. I didn't get your last statement, sorry. Like the the the, the teams are qualified to like uh you're you're saying that singularity that they say are oh, you 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 uh you work together but then we're saying like the question is how do we qualify are we saying that singularity net are the best people to make that decision um, yeah that's what we are we are we are proposing we are not concluding on that but we were just having that conversation and saying probably it's even they are the best people to even do this so that's what we're saying probably yeah i think uh yeah i i i hesitate with having kind of an outside organization kind of coordinate a process which should come out of itself um uh like i was saying in the other room one point not to like mix rooms too much but i think perhaps it's relevant here that uh when sometimes these de decentralized teams or, or groups can come together the coordination, the osmosis between them is often um, uh, uh, under un undervalued. Often it needs a separate organization to actually be the coordination, do the coordination orientation um, between, between those groups. So I guess like it's something where you say okay there's a deciding at the start of, okay these people are going to work together but i think okay that that's going to change but how if there's an outside organization saying you 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 and work together like there needs to be this process of emergence as well where actually the team say okay well actually we're not so good at this there might be this other team that's better at that but we can do this um and that yeah i guess how, how do we get over these information silos is the as the main thing yeah your about. point on emergence the uh, that organic emergence is very strong you know uh so for those of us just catching up the conversation we had a long conversation and uh we we came to some level of agreements where we said um different pools or different structures different strategies may be saving different things and um we said that deep funding as the rounds sh should be saving different purposes, uh, RFCs should be saving the different purposes, and RFPs should be dif saving different purposes. And we agree that if these are all saving different purposes, it also means that we cannot use the same structure that we use in one round for another, for another, and cannot be in the same format. Uh, one of the things we agreed was that um, okay, deep funding rounds are purely decentralized, de de decentralized but maybe rfps and rfcs may need some level of centralization um, to what extent we did not define but we're saying um that it's only wise to understand when a particular strategy might not be saving and so we're saying uh, maybe in some rfps we will need centralization where snet can do much more and then for rfcs as well, we still need centralization, but maybe reduced as compared to RFPs. So those were our thoughts before um, we came in. Felix, um, do you have anything to add up uh, before we start wrapping up? 
more. I think main takeaway is really like that everybody seemed to be agree like in Singularity that there could be multiple models running in parallel, satisfying multiple purposes. Like you mentioned, for example, deep funding is a model in itself, has very specific purposes and very specific parameters and design. And could be just interesting to have multiple models running actually in the Singularity Net ecosystem with different functionalities as well. While in one it's for the community vote, in another one maybe it's more SNET Foundation who decides, while in another one whatnot in this regard. And actually in this regard, so you see that deep funding becomes an incubator who is not only incubating or catalyzing pro proposals, but also leverage new designs for singularity internet models actually in this regard. Because the, if RFP, for example, also uh, one thing what was added is the timeline. For example, RFPs could be something what could be always open. It doesn't have to be tied to rounds in this regard. If we would assume that it would be an alternative model, one thing we could assume is let's do everything different than deep funding does. Deep funding has funding rounds. So RFP cycle can't have funding rounds. Deep funding, it's the whole community who votes. RFP process can't be the whole community who votes. So forcing already by default by taking deep funding already and to say, okay, what can it spark actually in this regard? And from the timeline, how can it work in a process additional to deep funding without replacing or adding overhead, but actually aligning to the already existing processes? And another one was, yeah, the, oh yeah this, this incubator. Yes, uh, I mentioned it quickly already. So deep funding is able to generate whole new models of governance as well for singularity and ecosystem. So that deep funding actually creates new versions of deep funding. The RFP process, for example, could be our own deep funding, let's say, for example, in this regard, which was incubated by deep funding, actually. Yeah, just to add a little light on that, what you said, I think um, what we said was um, RFCs would have can have their own governance structures that may be different. And that governance in itself is deep funding, generating new governance structure for SNET. And so we might even have more, more things coming up from deep funding, each of them having different governance systems that can be studied and um, um, that the uh, SNET community can actually check in to see how these models work independently. So this can be another use case. So that's one of the uh, points that um, we spoke about there. Yeah, Cordis, um, any wrap-up words on what we discussed before we... I, I did, but I, I lost it. Felix is some, really good at summarizing all that up. Um, very similar thoughts on, on all of that. So good stuff. Maybe one last thought is what Raphael uh, shared before in chat as well. We said already the process anyway could be very similar on how deep funding works for RFPs. So there could be first, there's first there could be, uh, wait, maybe let's share screen for a second. Because uh, Raphael, I pasted your stickies out to the Myra board as well. They actually would have first, came from you first. There has to be, this is actually an interesting one. We have to feel the pain of the ecosystem so to understand actually what is a real pain in singularity net where we know already community might have a have less understanding of the pain as singularity net foundation does then actually share the, the the pain checking for other patients or if it's only you who has the pain get in contact with foundation and discuss the pain then actually get confirmation if this is a pain to the community talking to them See if an internal foundation pain uh, to go to the next step, get in contact with a team of experts on RFP, potential RFP circle that will help you with the processes while launching a RFP and get your RFP to community vote. In, the, in this regard, yeah, you mentioned community vote, where Rater led to the discussion was to say, could this be Singularity Net Foundation actually who decides on, on, on this one? Yeah, potentially, right? Uh, if if we go toward more towards centralization because, uh, well, of everything that we discussed, uh, yeah, it can be changing. 
Or is that where um, potentially, so once the RFP is approved, that could instantiate the RFC to, to bring in collaborators to get that started and, and build it out? Yeah, the, RF, the, the collaboration itself would start on step two, actually, because if you are from the community, you are saying to your colleague or to your peer, uh, do you feel this pain as well? So do you feel this pain as well? And they were, yes, I feel so. There you would start to ideate and talk to people and, and, and mingle into something, right? But uh, yes, it would be nice to have in a later stage an RFC that, in a more structured way, yes. That's a good one. Feelings. Great, Raphael. Nice one. Okay, thanks. And by the way, on step 3.B, it was uh, if foundation, uh, if the foundation understands the pain of the community, get the confirmation uh, if it's a real pain, right? So talk to the community and say, hey, do you guys feel this is a pain? And it's not only coming from us in a one-sided way. So if, com if, if the foundation get a comma, get the confirmation if this is a pain to the community. Yeah. I know you're you're a bit of a masochist, but but does there always need to be pain involved? It, I, 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 I was I was thinking that um, in the last round we had uh, four RFPs and and three were um, for creating uh, cool stuff uh, uh, that is aligned with our strategy. There's no real pain yet; it's just creating and building new stuff. The reputation system that was uh, also an RFP, well, you could say there is potential pain there. Well, there is pain on my side uh, making all these calculations. So there you may have a good point. Um, then um, this content knowledge graph, it's not pain yet. But I think if we don't do it, there will be pain in the future. Or there will not be pain, but there will just be a loss of resources and value. So only the, 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 the perspective of pain, I, I understand where you're coming from, but it's not the only uh, perspective, I think. Indeed, it, it's, it was just a hyperbole, hyperbole uh, the pain. Uh, but yeah, it not necessarily being a pain, but we can drill to the why the found, why SNET decided to go in this direction and find the pain itself, where the why from the SNET is developing the RFPs, uh, if you drill enough. So it's going to go to the society and the needs of decentralizing the, the, the uh, artificial intelligence and so on. But yes, indeed, it might be something uh, from a good perspective and not only from a bad perspective in this sense, yes. You know, when I was just an anecdote, when I was in the agency world and uh, the sales, uh, they had this method and they called it the pain chain. And it means that if you find some pain, you go to the boss of that person and see if he feels that pain and then go to their boss and feel if he's and then uh, go right to the top where uh, somebody is that can, can decide on how to relieve uh, that pain. So it's the pain chain. I like it this. Yeah, now you are talking to the right person, right? Because you went through the, the whole pain chain. Yeah. yeah, nice. Nice. Well, yeah, this was once again a really good discussion. So I think it's time to wrap up as well. We are in this call already since two and a half hours. By the way, today we, it was, uh, we had 28 people in the town hall. This was largest participants of town hall so far. I really loved to see some of my colleagues there, which is uh, quite uh, special. So, so did you or anybody else uh, publish it on Metamost or something that we had this town hall? Yes, I published it on Metamost today. <laughs> but I also published around, I don't know, 30 links all across the internet. <laughs> all the no, no, no. It's great. It's great. It's a great initiative, Judith. And um, that is exactly what we try to achieve with Mattermost, right? To And also with this ring of Mattermost, uh, where community and internal people would be uh, easier coming together. So this is living proof of that. Uh, so uh, mission succeeded, I would say.
And well, also 27 people were present at a given moment. So yeah, kudos to the team uh, that managed to do that. Yes, very nice. Well, hopefully it's only going to grow from here. <laughs> That's the spirit, yes. Although January, usually you see a little bit uh, of a dip when it comes to meetings, meeting participants. Everyone's still figuring out their goals and they're all very focused on all kinds of stuff. Usually Zoom meetings are not the highest priority for some people in January. So we might see a little bit of dip and people need a bit time to get into the new year. A lot of people take the first three weeks off or first four weeks off of the year. They're still on holiday, so but hopefully from there we'll only grow. Yeah, uh, having interesting uh, things to talk about, like topic of today, that makes a lot of difference. And then uh, giving some outlook and, and notifying people in time about uh, these things will help a lot. So yeah, I think this was uh, was a was a successful call. So I appreciate it a lot. And uh, not sure what all the learn. Yeah, the, the, that list was very, very insightful. So, so yeah, I think we had some good uh, conversations in the call tonight, but also leading up to the call, right, Felix? So uh, appreciated all of that a lot. Nice. Let's uh, wrap it up. Thanks so much. Great job and great job, Judith. Nice. Thanks, great job, everybody. Thanks, everyone.